Sunday, based on a true story. The parents who wouldn't stop hoping. The cop who wouldn't stop searching. The kidnappers who wouldn't stop running. The courageous young woman who wouldn't stop fighting. The movie premiere you won't forget. The abduction of Carrie Swenson, Sunday on NBC. Coming up next on Nightwatch. Nightwatch learns what might be done about a deadly intersection. What the IRS has done about a tough tax form. And Dr. Dina Dell shows us what not to do before a drug test. Nightwatch is next. This is chicken number 2009. Please, send me a new way to make it. Kraft introduces new chicken applause dinners. Four easy ways to make your chicken, like barbecue chicken and scalloped potatoes. Divers scour reefs the Atocha might have struck in 1622. According to further documents found in the Spanish archives, the Atocha and another galleon sank within four miles of each other. The second ship, the Santa Margarita, was partly salvaged by the Spaniards, but the Atocha disappeared under shifting sands within a year. According to her manifest, the Atocha carried 901 bars of silver, 161 bars or discs of gold, and some 255,000 silver coins. In months of diving, Fisher's crew locates many wrecks, ranging from modern fishing boats to a vessel sunk during the Civil War. There are lost anchors, chains, and fish traps, but none of this comparatively modern refuse yields any clue to the Atocha. Still, Fisher persists, widening the area of search. In 1971, in a shallow area called the Quicksands, an object is found that stirs hope. It's a large anchor, obviously very old. Over 15 feet long with a huge iron ring, the anchor's size and antique design suggest that it could have belonged to the Atocha. But there is no way to prove the connection, and search in the surrounding sand yields no conclusive evidence. The hunt by now has become vastly expensive and has yielded nothing of comparative value. In an all-out effort, Fisher brings a barge to the site. For three months, her crew will excavate the sea bottom in the area where the ancient anchor was found. It is likely that much of the Atocha's wooden hull would have rotted away after three centuries underwater, and heavy metal, including the treasure, could well have settled deep into the sand. But through the summer of 1972, months of costly digging will produce not a single trace of the Atocha's presence. Of 1972, as bad weather closes in, Mel Fisher's treasure hunt appears a fiasco. Fisher is all but broke and has been forced to lay off many of his crew. Relying on close associates and family members like his eldest son Dirk, he has little hard evidence to support his claim that he is on the brink of finding the Atocha. Sure, Fisher's galleon headquarters is besieged by impatient creditors. Here is David there. Splat's returning his call. Fisher's cause has been hurt by Hi, his David. chronic overstatements and exaggerations. The man who spoke just months ago as if millions were within his grasp now has trouble meeting routine expenses. At the eye of the storm is his general manager and press representative, Bleth McHaley. As I say, we, you know, you can't get bought out of a turnip, so. What are we going to do? When you don't find things, go find treasure, the money doesn't come in. And in the winter time is always a hard time to raise money. Okay. And it was really pretty bad. Through a lean winter, Fisher's operation is kept alive by friends and crew members who refuse to accept defeat. For each, finding the Atocha has become a challenge that verges on obsession. 
Among the most determined is a photographer diver, Don Kincaid. I think most of the frustration that we felt then was simply an inability to do any work, not necessarily an inability to find anything. A lot of times we couldn't go out to sea because we didn't have enough money to buy fuel for the Virgilona to go out or enough to buy groceries. So the guys would kick in as much money as, uh, as we had in the bank just to, just to finance a trip for the company, which was really scraping the bottom of the barrel because none of us had been paid for 16 or 20 weeks. By the spring of 1973, Mel Fisher's hopes are alive again. He has managed to acquire a powerful tugboat, the South Wind, and adapt it for treasure hunting. Though the South Wind was designed to work in protected inland waters, Fisher needs her tremendous horsepower at sea. All right, everybody ready? All right, Jimmy, get your pen now. Fisher employs one of his own inventions, so-called mailboxes. Elbow-shaped tubes, which, when lowered underwater, serve to deflect the south wind's prop wash downward at the sea bottom. Magnetometers have long indicated many promising metal concentrations lying deep under mud and sand. And now, there is a far more effective way to uncover them. Divers work below in a chaotic twilight of swirling sand. Bit by bit, Fisher enlarges the search area until the sea bottom resembles a battlefield strewn with craters. Everything now depends on finding treasure and finding it soon. If not, Fisher's fragile base of credit and investor confidence will soon collapse. His perennial rallying cry, today's the day, is wearing thin. After almost three years of search, the sands begin to yield some promise. Blackened by corrosion, looking much like pieces of coal, silver coins begin to appear in the sand. First one, then several dozen, then hundreds, and finally more than a thousand coins will be found during one memorable day. Some coins are clean enough to be identified immediately. The crew can tell they are Spanish and feel certain that the Atocha or the Santa Margarita have been found at last. But before a definite claim can be made, the entire hoard of coins must be cleaned and subject to expert examination. The process of cleaning the coins will lag far behind the pace of discovery. Centuries of incrustation must be carefully removed in the deliberate, unhurried atmosphere of the laboratory. The coins are Spanish. The famous silver pieces of eight and four. All were mined and minted in Peru and Mexico, origins consistent with the known cargo of the Atocha. A final report on all the coins is years away, but their gleaming beauty inspires the search as never before. When it comes to designing a luxury touring sedan, you continually stress precision. You overemphasize ergonomics and select only the finest leathers. The last thing you do is cut corners. You save that for the handling. The Acura Legend from a new division of American Honda, exclusively at Acura Dealers. First day of work. Well, wish me luck. You'll do fine. Oh, I'll be on time. Hey, Bill, wanna go fishing? Nope. 
I'm going to work. Want to make a good impression? I hear there's a new kid starting today. Oh, I hope he's cute. We're open in a few minutes, what sir. What if they think it's a little late to start a new profession? You got what it takes, you know it's true. You're a real Let you show them a trick or two. Let's see, that's three bacon, egg, and cheese biscuits, one egg McMuffin, two sausage muffin with egg, and one large OJ. Are you sure you never did this before? Thank you. Come again. How'd it go? I don't know how they ever got along without me. Well, I could have told them that. <laughs> Going for the gold takes great moves. But to win, I created my own special twist. Now, that's the critical difference. You know, even with a tough headache, I have to give more. So I take Nuprin. Two Nuprin give me more relief than extra strength Tylenol. That's the critical difference. Medical evidence shows two little Nuprin give more relief than extra strength Tylenol. That's Nuprin strength. And still, it's gentler on stomachs than aspirin. The critical difference in pain relief. Nuprin strength. One word distinguishes the American Express card from the others. Member. And membership has its privileges. We lost our card, our cash. Even our passport. You've come to the right place. I can help you. That's great. Right? That was an easy sale. No need to wrap it. I think I can fix it, honey. That's why I got buyer's assurance. I left my prescription medicine at home. Don't worry. Global Assist can help. If you think the two best-selling spray cleaners are alike, you're in for a big surprise. There's really a big difference. One's been improved by adding a powerful, fast-acting grease dissolver that no other spray has. New, improved Formula 409 spray cleaner. Big difference, big improvement. <gasps> Three Guys Plumbing. For clogs at their worst. Uh-oh, it's for you. Liquid Plumber is the plumber to call first. Fisher digs on in the area where the coins first appeared, a spot so rich it is now called the Bank of Spain. The work is noisy, hot, and often monotonous. Through the long summer days, the south wind's engines roar from dawn to dusk. As the summer wears on, divers will discover more and more artifacts, utilitarian objects like eating utensils. Though centuries old, many have been remarkably preserved from deterioration, probably from being buried deeply in silt and sand. In June, Dirk Fisher makes an extraordinary find. He uncovers a mariner's astrolabe, an ancient navigational instrument made of brass alloy that could well have been aboard the Atocha. A precursor of the sextant, the astrolabe is one of the few of this type known still to exist. The discovery of this rare artifact will bring Fisher increased attention and support. Father's Day, 1973. Kim Fisher presents his offering. Two large pieces of gold. Gold! Yeah. Oh. 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 Unlike silver, the gold retains its luster, despite hundreds of years of submersion. Yeah, Fantastic! Jimmy! Oh, Boy, that, that must weigh, what, 10 pounds? God, it felt like it. Finds are now being made almost daily. It is certain that a valuable wreck has been found. But is it the Atocha? Fisher has long insisted publicly that it is. But proving his case is difficult. Like the boy who cried wolf too often, he is open to doubt and criticism on every side. I think it is, yeah. No markings on it. 
Artifacts and valuables from the site are subject to minute examination. For the past three years, Jean Lyon has followed the trail of the Atocha with mounting excitement. The materials all speak with a voice to us about what ship it was, where it came from, and about the people that were aboard. The gold disc bears the royal seal, or the Seyo Real, this round seal with the king's name. It had been essayed and was stamped with the, the mark showing its carat rating, 15 carats, three grains, or three quarters of a carat. The general wealth of gold found aboard was one thing which indicated that this was a, a major ship, a passenger carrying galleon. Many, many coins were found. Dating found on the coins themselves is often incomplete. It will be the last two digits of a, of a chronological year number. But no coins have been found which post-dated 1622. This rosary is beautifully made and speaks also of the disaster and the way in which people had to meet it in the best way they could possibly by telling the beads of the rosary as, as the ship neared destruction. The cumulative evidence led us to the conclusion that we had one of two ships, Santa Margarita or the Nuestra Señora de Atocha. Which one it was, we did not yet know. You got it the Milky Way. In Key West, the mood is jubilant. A party is thrown aboard the galleon for Fisher's friends and supporters. After a long, hard winter, treasure hunting is fun again. Word of Fisher's success and imminent wealth is spreading fast. He holds court with old treasure tales, a man who is living what most hardly dare to dream. And as soon as the engines went off, all the sand started tumbling down. It covered this chest up, you know. So fast. Yeah. Fisher's confidence will soon be confirmed by events. Within a week, an electrifying find will be made at the site. Objects that will stir so much excitement and controversy are deceptively drab at first glance. The diver who found the first one will later recall it looked like a loaf of bread. The gray oblong bar seems impossibly heavy. It's a struggle to bring it to the surface. The divers have always known that both the Atocha and the partially salvaged Santa Margarita carried bars of silver. Just days before, Jean Lyon jokingly asked that a silver ingot be found. Now, he will be informed that three such bars have been brought aboard the South Wind. The office called and said they found a, a mess of silver bars down here. We came alongside the South Wind. There was a large crew of people and there in this tub were these three blackened items the first ingots i'd seen in uh, except in photographs for for years and years but they looked beautiful and we could see even through the the uh, silver sulfide covering the bars that there were markings on them at this point i didn't know what a serial number should look like i'd only seen it written out in spanish I didn't know that they would be in Roman numerals. But as soon as I saw them, I knew that's what they must be. This is the, these are the marks that show the fineness of the silver. CCCLXXX, which is 380, so it's 2 million, 2,000. I'm just guessing, uh, Bill, that those are the, uh, the mint mark. Lyon hopes that he can match the serial numbers on the bars with entries on the manifests of either the Atocha or the Santa Margarita. Returning to Key West with notes and drawings, Lyon will spend three days poring over microfilm copies of the ancient manifests. I first searched the Santa Margarita registry. 
I found no such bar numbers. I began on the Atocha registry with the Cartagena lading, that is the cargo loaded on the ship in Cartagena, and had gone only a few pages into that when I found a shipment made of crown money paid for a head tax on slaves sold in Cartagena after being shipped from West Africa. One of those was bar number 4584, one of the three bar numbers we had found. The serial number written out in Spanish script, the drawing of bar number 4584, and the bar itself. The evidence is dramatically clear. For Lyon, this moment is sheer delight. Patience and scholarship have unlocked a mystery more than three centuries old. A final test is planned to confirm identification of the bars. The Atocha's manifest lists the weight of bar number 4584 when it was loaded by the Spanish in 1622. Now, 351 years later, the weight should match exactly. A scale has been preset to 63 and 6 tenths pounds. It's a breathless moment as bar 4584 is weighed for the first time in three centuries. The weight, too, is the same. This seemed to me very clear proof and definitive proof. And while I felt certain myself, we came under direct, strong, and virtually immediate challenge on this identification, partly because it was to the interest of many people that this not be the Atocha. They couldn't admit that this might be the Atocha. Well, SEC investigation begins, all because we had found what we said we were going to find. And I think they expected to come down and find that we had taken little old lady's sugar bowl money and uh, typical of a, a con, we'd have a little rowboat out there and go around the island once or twice looking for treasure and abscond with people's money. Well, I think they found out that that wasn't true. Fisher is embroiled in bitter controversy by the time Florida state officials make a dramatic visit to take charge of the treasure. 200 silver coins, number 1955. While taking no stand on the identity of the wreck, the state of Florida has claimed jurisdiction over it from the beginning. By contract, all treasure recovered must be turned over to the state for safekeeping. Fisher is unable to sell or display his fines because of his uneasy partnership with the state. Controversy over the authenticity of the treasure and a government investigation of Fisher's business practices will plague him further in the months ahead. And his troubles are as widely publicized as his success. Consider the strange and restless destiny of this gold and silver. It was mined by Indian slaves as the fruit of Spanish conquest. It was lost and then found again after centuries had passed and the world had been transformed. Yet still, it moves from hand to hand, borne on the tides of human enterprise and power, and its ultimate destination still unknown. Humor helps you deal with life's unexpected possibilities, and so does MasterCard. If you lose it, which I did, they replace it. Thank you. And thank you, MasterCard. MasterCard, master the possibilities. Why take a plain bath when you can take a bath in Calgon Moisturizing Foam Bath? A plain bath doesn't have aloe vera, lanolin, or rose water and glycerin. Soften your skin with Calgon Moisturizing Foam Baths. About your sandwich, Ned. No Miracle Whip. Check, see if the Zabraki's next door have some. Got some mayonnaise. Or you could try the Parsons next door. A sandwich just isn't a sandwich without the tangy zip of Miracle Whip salad dressing. The bread spread from Kraft. See the light. Try Miracle Whip Light reduced calorie salad dressing with a third fewer calories. 
This is a liquid bleach. And this is a bright pink. I thought that might get your attention. But don't worry. This is a whole new liquid bleach. New liquid Clorox, too. It's a non-chlorine bleach, so it's perfectly safe to pour on all your washable colors and get results that are absolutely striking. What's more, new liquid Clorox 2 is also powerful enough to beautifully whiten whites. Try new liquid Clorox 2. Pour it on. We'll return to the real wonders of the world on the best of the National Geographic specials right after these messages. The Weepocky Cheese Co-op would like to salute the folks at Hardy's for their quarter pound cheeseburger. In the past, our cheese has had to sit on some pretty puny burgers, flatter than a mule's. <laughs> well, but Hardy's quarter pound cheeseburger is made with 100% American beef that's cooked up real thick and juicy. We're proud to be a part of such a noble burger, and we thank you. How to do? Hardy's quarter pound cheeseburger combo with regular fries and a large drink, just two fifty-five. notice the old ideas a lot of times are the best ideas like good service attention to detail you know when you walk into a Publix they still mean it when they smile and say hello they still help you find things in the store and they still take your bags out to your car it's an old idea good service at Publix it never went away of the silver bars, material continues to come from the site. It's always enough to keep hopes high, but never sufficient to satisfy critics or silence rivals. Fisher's crew is confident that sooner or later they will hit the mother load, the bulk of the Atocha's treasure concentrated in one spot. But for the moment, they have only tantalizing bits and pieces. jewelry, a few coins, and even a gold cup, heavily encrusted with shells and limestone. In March 1975, Fisher, his family, and crew finally will see the treasure divided with the state. They arrive for the formal proceedings in Florida's capital, Tallahassee. Thank you. In an unused jail cell, all the treasure found so far is briefly put on public display. For visitors, it's a dazzling sight. A glimpse of the opulence and grandeur of Imperial Spain. display was probably the personal property of wealthy passengers aboard the galleon. And these artifacts provide fascinating glimpses of their way of life. For instance, there is the crushed gold cup of unusual design. It is speculated that a pellet mounted inside the cup was intended to react chemically to the presence of poison and thus warn its owner of treachery. None of the gold pieces found so far are listed on the Spanish manifests. Most probably, they were contraband. Smuggling was common in the 17th century, even though the penalties could be severe. The division begins. Each object has been assigned a relative value in terms of abstract points rather than dollars. 
One nine five zero fifty points. Preparations and behind-the-scenes bargaining have taken months, and the formalities today will go on for hours. One seven two two fifty five points. For Mel Fisher, a confusing and frustrating paper chase lies ahead. Soon after this division, the United States Supreme Court will rule the treasure does not lie in Florida state waters after all. But soon after that, the federal government will claim that it has jurisdiction. More than a year later, Fisher will still not know for certain exactly how much of the treasure is really his. As expensive legal battles rage on, it seems clear that the trouble with treasure has only begun when it is found. It's on the last page, 2036 gold chalice, 18,000 points. 18,000. Now, there part of, of those total points. Come Fisher by now has gained an important ally. Duncan Matthewson, a marine archaeologist, has joined the treasure hunters as a consultant. Leaves them 19,000 more points to choose this afternoon. Few scholars care to brave the controversy that still surrounds Fisher's operation. Even now, Florida officials are careful to avoid endorsing Fisher's claim that the Atocha has been found. Under Matthewson's direction, extensive new surveys of the wreck site have been launched from Key West. Charting and record keeping have often been haphazard in the past. Matthewson is the first to apply a rigorous scientific approach to the hunt. The archaeologist knows that the Atocha's remains are widely scattered on the seafloor. But the locations of objects found are concentrated along a hypothetical line extending from the southeast to the northwest. As we go towards the northwest, we come uh, across the edge of the shallow quicksands area, and this is the beginning point of the area that Treasure Salvers has been finding most of their uh, material over the last three years. But as you go out from that impact area towards the northwest, the ballast thins out, the artifact concentrations thin out. This led me to believe that we had to go back down the line, back towards the deep area, and it, would, it, it should be here that we would find the main mother load. Many of the treasure hunters doubt Matthewson's deep water theory. But the idea makes sense to Fisher's eldest son, Dirk. By July 13, 1975, Dirk has led the search into murky waters more than 40 feet down. I was walking up uh, one of the gunnels of the boat, and I hear this screaming. I look out, and Dirk just broke the surface, and he's waving his arms, screaming as loud as he could. And at first, I thought something was wrong, you know? I got up and I finally made out that he wanted a buoy. So we went back and got in the whaler and started up and got some buoys together and went out through the anchor in about the spot where Dirk was. And by that time he calmed down enough and we were close enough I could figure out what he was saying. He said there was bronze cannons there, what he'd been looking for all along out in the deep water. Uh, threw the anchor down, swam down along the line, and uh, there they were, five bronze cannons sitting right on the top. Like apparitions in a dream, the cannon lie in plain sight. And in the general area Fisher has searched for so many years, countless times divers and search boats must have passed near them. In the next few days, the location and positions of the cannon will be carefully documented. For Fisher's crew, the sight is staggering. After a long game of hide and seek, the Atocha seems now to say, come and get me, here I am. Excitement is intense by the time the first cannon are raised. Since the silver bars were found, Fisher and his crew have yearned for such evidence as this, impossible to forge or fake. Each cannon barrel is cast in solid bronze and weighs more than a ton and a half.
controversy and disappointment make this a moment of supreme satisfaction. Here is vindication for Mel Fisher in his 53rd year, provided by his 21-year-old son. I've been looking longer for one of these than any of you guys. <laughs> about 30 years. Well, you found it. Is this the first one you found? Yep. I've chased down about a thousand bronze cannon stories, and they all piddled out. <laughs> I'm beginning to think they never made any. <laughs> Again, the records of the Atocha are checked against evidence from the sea. This time, the result will be conclusive. 1607. On you. I wonder where the weight's at. Here it is on the list, on the inventory list that Gene Lyon got in Sevilla, one piece of 3,110 pounds. So listing weights and types This is of listing cannon. weights of bronze cannon aboard the Satocha. So that is positive identification that this cannon is off the Atocha. Gather round, mighties, and you shall hear of the greatest show from far or near. They sing and they dance on water with ease. But they're not just in boats, they're on water skis. It's the best of us pirates in hundreds of years. You'll be jumping and screaming and laughing to tears. So bring everyone, all you boys and girls, to the new ski pirate show at our great sea world. It doesn't quite rhyme, but you get the point. The Wee Pocky Cheese Co-op would like to salute the folks at Hardy's for their quarter-pound cheeseburger. In the past, our cheese has had to sit on some pretty puny burgers, flatter than a mule's. <laughs> well, but Hardy's quarter-pound cheeseburger is made with 100% American beef that's cooked up real thick and juicy. We're proud to be a part of such a noble burger, and we thank you. How to do? Hardy's quarter-pound cheeseburger combo with regular fries and a large drink, just two fifty-five. Ever ask yourself why the people at Publix go out of their way to treat you like they do? Why there always seems to be someone around to answer your questions or to help you find what you're looking for? It's pretty simple if you think about it. At Publix, they know there are plenty of supermarkets out there and you can go anywhere you want. Return to the real wonders of the world on the best of the National Geographic specials right after these messages. This is Wiley Coyote. He's been trying to catch that guy for years. What makes him think he can now? Ah, the Donnelly Directory. It's not the same old yellow pages. It's maps, guides, and emergency information. It's a complete colorful yellow pages that's better and easier to use. Won't he ever learn? Oh, no. Good thinking. The Donnelly Directory. That was close. The Donnelly Directory. It's a better Yellow Pages and much, much more. Come feel the freshness. Tropicana. Tropicana Pure Premium shades your morning with a taste so fresh, so pure, so natural. Tropicana. Pure Premium. Only Florida oranges. With nothing added, nothing taken away. The taste could only be one. Tropicana. Feel the freshness. It's pure Tropicana. Saying no to drugs. If more of us said it, together we could solve our problems. That's our goal. We want to provide the encouragement to say no. Sure, it's hard. But when you're surrounded by hundreds, even thousands of people who feel the same way you do, Saying no could become the thing to do. Won't you help kids like me and adults like you make saying no to drugs the thing to do in Jacksonville? Join in Red Ribbon Week, May 10th through 16th. Nine bronze cannon are found and will be eventually raised from the sea bottom. Five are too corroded to be specifically identified, but the remaining four bear royal shields and weights that coincide exactly with the Atocha's armament list from the archives in Seville.
Yatocha's crew will celebrate only briefly. Certain that the bulk of Yatocha's treasure lies near the spot where the cannon were found, they are eager to return to the site. Dirk Fisher receives a $10,000 reward from his father. From boyhood, he has known the day-to-day -day drudgery of treasure hunting. But now, a dream is coming true. Dirk, along with his wife Angel, leads a group of divers back to sea a few days later. Don Kincaid recalls the night of July 19th, 1975. Well, I was asleep and uh, heard, a, heard a voice that said, hey, look out up there. And uh, I didn't have my glasses on. I woke up, went out to check, and thought I saw somebody in the back deck. Went back in and put my glasses on and then heard, the, heard it again. Somebody said, hey, look out out there. And I walked outside and didn't see anybody, but I noticed that the boat had a list, which is no big deal. It happens all the time. Kincaid retraces his movements early the next morning, only minutes before chaos and tragedy. So I went down below to, uh, after getting the flashlight, to wake up the engineer so that we could go down inside the engine room and uh, straighten the ship out. We went down, walked along the deck, went back into the galley, which goes right down into the engine room on the earth wind. And while I was standing in the galley, I see water start to come in the door. I yelled at the other guy and got around outside and just walked up the side of the boat. As the boat turned itself over, just walked physically up the hull and onto the bottom of the thing in about five steps, and it was upside down. It was pitch blackness. It was no masks, no lights at that point. The light that I had had been knocked out of my hands. Uh, diesel fuel in the water. If you opened your eyes in the water, you wouldn't have been able to see anything after that. So we do what we could and couldn't get, couldn't get into any of the rooms. Complete disorientation, ropes and lines and stuff floating all over the place. Finally, after uh, about 15 minutes, the guy that was in the engine room managed to get himself out. He had to work upside down with a flashlight that he had found floating around in the water. Uh, with no mask or anything. He managed to get himself outside. It took him 15 minutes to do it. And about three minutes after he got outside, the boat sank completely. The north wind has sunk joining the Atocha on the seafloor near the Marquesas Keys. Somehow, an undetected leak developed in the night, causing the tug to capsize with little warning. Trapped in their cabins, Dirk and Angel Fisher and another diver, Rick Gage, were unable to escape. Shock and grief rock the small, closely-knit world of the treasure hunters. In one bewildering and tragic week, Dirk's triumph has been followed by a loss so sudden and fateful. It almost seems a deliberate retribution by the sea. Many here today, the search for the Atocha becomes a more somber but essential task. We all had a sort of a rededication of going out to find that main part of the wreck. We all felt that it was there now that Dirk had found the cannons. It was very important for us all. Myself, the Jean, the crew, everybody. Within days, a boat will go out to stand guard on the site, and soon the search will begin again. April 1976. Though small finds continue to be made, the bulk of the Atocha's treasure still has not been found. Anchored permanently at the site, a rusting surplus Coast Guard vessel proclaims Mel Fisher's right to the Atocha, an issue still contested by the federal government. A crew of 
divers lives aboard and continues the search. The area where the cannon were found has been combed methodically with little result. On periodic visits to the site, Fisher continues to press the hunt. Hey, hey, Duncan, how are you doing? How are you doing? For historians, it is satisfaction enough that the Atocha's resting place now is known. But Mel Fisher, first and always, is after treasure. The mathematics of his quest are still beguiling. He estimates he has spent three million to recover eight million dollars worth of treasure so far. But if nothing more is found, he personally might receive little more than a living wage for his efforts when all debts and obligations are settled. Well, here he comes. We will find out what's wrong with him. What do you see, Pat? Doesn't look too good down there, Mel. I think they're our last Still night. young divers scour the sea bottom. With them, Fisher retains a close affinity. Because of their age, perhaps, and despite his, they share a common optimism. Move the block over right where it was, you know, before it started dragging. Because this green line's vital. If we get that right, today's the day. <laughs> I just made up my mind I'm going to find it and uh, probably just keep going till I do. One of the things that keeps us going is the, uh, the ideas like today's the day and if it doesn't happen to be at the end of the evening, sometimes we'll say tomorrow's the day. But uh, strange as it may seem, I got the feeling we're going to find it in the next few days. I really think uh, we're that close I can taste it. No one who knows Mel Fisher doubts that the hunt will go on. And if and when all the treasure is found, only Mel Fisher can say whether he has paid too much for it or not. The average person takes over 25,000 showers in their lifetime. But ironically, all this showering can do damage to your skin. That's why you should use Aloe and Lanolin Soap, the skin conditioning bar from Jergens. It contains Aloe, legendary for healing skin, and Lanolin for softness. So whether you're taking your first shower or your 20,000 in first... Edna, you're gonna stay in there all day? Your skin really needs Aloe and Lanolin Soap from Jergens. Born with that hair color, or is that you doing? In salons, the talk is about Miss Clairol. Hairdressers choose Miss Clairol more often than any other hair color. If I could be a blonde like that, I'd do it in a minute. Miss Clairol, 27. Superb color, time after time. That's the Miss Clairol salon look. No wonder hairdressers choose Miss Clairol more often than any other hair color. The Miss Ford Taurus boasts a highly advanced aerodynamic design, as well as a sophisticated suspension for quick, precise handling. All of which is really not so remarkable for a world-class sedan. If we were talking about a sedan. This is the Ford Taurus wagon. The wagon you'll want to drive, even when there's nothing to carry. You're watching the best of the National Geographic specials. Ever notice the old ideas a lot of times are the best ideas, like good service, attention to detail? You know, when you walk into a Publix, they still mean it when they smile and say hello. They still help you find things in the store, and they still take your bags out to your car. It's an old idea, good service. At Publix, it never went away.
The Wee Pocky Cheese Co-op would like to salute the folks at Hardy's for their quarter pound cheeseburger. In the past, our cheese has had to sit on some pretty puny burgers, flatter than a mule's. <laughs> well, but Hardy's quarter pound cheeseburger is made with 100% American beef that's cooked up real thick and juicy. We're proud to be a part of such a noble burger, and we thank you. How to do? Hardy's quarter pound cheeseburger combo with regular fries and a large drink, just two fifty-five. Presented by McDonald's. It's a good time. And by Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. And SeaWorld, home of Baby Shamu and her family of killer whales. Nine years after this film was completed, in National Geographic's 14th year of following the story, a most remarkable epilogue occurred. Mel Fisher found the treasure of the Atocha. On July 20th, 1985, his crew struck the ship's mother load and uncovered a cache of New World riches. They found gold hundreds of pounds of bullion, discs, and chains. There were magnificent, uncut Colombian emeralds numbering in the thousands, some as big as walnuts. There were also the personal possessions of those long-ago voyagers, the details of everyday life bearing silent witness to the ancient tragedy. The value of the Atocha's treasure may reach into the billions. For Mel Fisher, his family, and supporters, the dream became reality. Next time, on the best of the National Geographic specials, we'll look at another fascinating corner of our ever-changing and ever-expanding world. Till then, I'm Mike Farrell for the National Geographic Society.